Matthew this morning, so we'll go to Matthew chapter 2. It's hard this time of year to escape. Uh, it, uh, it's some form of exposure to uh, uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Has anybody not seen at least part of that storyline sometime during the course of this year? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite for me. I've done. If you know Dickens, you know that uh, most of everything he wrote was a, a it was a, a challenge to the the kind of the aristocracy and the class divide in England of his day. So it was largely his novels were commentaries, and and all of them, with the exception of one, were told from the disenfranchised point of view. Like, uh, Oliver Twist. All of the, they were all told from, with one exception. The one exception is the Christmas Carol. The Christmas Carol is told not from the disenfranchised, but from the enfranchised point of view. It makes that one fairly unique. And although I've got a whole basket full of great quotes from Dickens from a Christmas Carol that I love, one of the ones that I like uh, the most is the bidding of the spirit of Christmas present when uh, Scrooge first meets him, and he with this jovial, large, bounding voice says, come in and know me better, man. And I love that that particular uh, a line because I just, when he says that, I hear Christ say, now come in and know me better uh, on this day that we honor my birth. And and so it's it's from that kind of perspective that I wanted to begin this morning. Now where we'll, we're going to be this morning is in Matthew, oh, sorry, is in Matthew, and we're going to focus on this, uh, this, uh, uh, this post-birth narrative that accounts for the history after Bethlehem. And so I want to begin with a kind of a graphic here that'll, that, that may help us. Uh, because, the, uh, we'll put it this way. This is the year 2021. But... Is it the year 21, 2021 in the Jewish calendar? No. What about the Chinese calendar? Okay, between the Gregorian and the Julian calendar, which says it's 2021? Huh? Yeah, you may be right. I don't even know that was a rhetorical question. Thank you. <laughs> no. so, uh, it's really tough to be able to try to establish dating that, that will endure the test of time. If we just try to say January 19th, that it, well, so scripture does this most extraordinary thing. It gives us this range, and one of them is the range of Caesar Augustus, his reign. One of them is during the reign of Caesar Augustus, the time that Herod was regent king of Judea. And the other one is the time of Caesar Augustus was, in, oh, was Caesar of Rome, or was emperor of Rome. Herod was the, the, the regent king in Judea, and Quirinius was serving in all of Syria, and we're going to get to him in a minute. Now, those three establish that zone right there. I can't tell you exactly how large that zone is, but that's the time of Christ's birth. That's the time of the visitation of the Magi. That is the time of the descent into Egypt. And so barring the inability to, to, to navigate Jewish calendar, Chinese calendar, uh, Gregorian, Julian, we're given a, a really fantastic, very narrow window of time when this took place. So from that perspective, let's begin this morning. And I'll, I'll read as we begin, and then we will uh, then we'll start to walk through this. And we're, we're going to make some stops along the way. But remember, our focus this morning is this, know him better by his birth. Okay, so after Jesus, I'll start in, in chapter 2, verse 1 of Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who, is, uh, who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. When the King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the pe peoples, chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where was the Christ 
Christ to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But out of you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard, um, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house, and they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, incense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream to go back, uh, not to go back to Herod, they left to their own country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So they got up, and they took the child and his mother, and during the night they left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I'll call my son. I won't go any further. That's as far as, as we're really going to head this morning. Not many of us read plays, but if you do read a play, then you will notice that in the front end of every play that you read is going to be the cast. And so if you pick up a copy of, say, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, you'll thumb through the first through, you know, uh, copyright pages or things, and you're going to get to the cast. And the reason that that is given in a play is because uh, playwrights want to be able to integrate you into who the major people in the, the narrative are that helps you understand when you start to <clears throat> unfold the narrative of a play. Plays are differently written than novels. Novels are differently produ produced than uh, than cinema, or uh, so you have to, to you have to compensate for the gaps that that come in stage. And so a little bit of a primer on who these people are is good. So it'll begin with kind of the most prominent players, and then it'll work their way through down to, through the ancillary players, and then some of the the, the, the background players will be at the end, but you're going to have this list. And so this morning, we'll just take a, a, a quick look at who these major people are. Not that this is a play, this is a piece of history, but it will look at, uh, take a, a look at who these people are. Now, I picked Julius Caesar intentionally because Julius Caesar was the great uncle of who we know of as Caesar Augustus, who was not born Caesar Augustus. He was born Gaius Octavius. Caesar Augustus, uh, uh, Julius Caesar actually adopted Gaius, Augustus, uh, Gaius Octavius as a son so he could bear the name Caesar. And the reason he did that is because Gaius as a young man expressed extraordinary ability for leadership and Caesar felt, or um, uh, Julius Caesar felt that he would likely rise to leadership one day and wanted his name, Caesar, to be born in another generation of, uh, of, of Roman leadership. So that's how he became um, uh, known as Caesar Augustus. Uh, and he's one of the, 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 quote, players, one of the people that we should know a little bit about here. Now, that's one of the time frames that are marked. We'll come back to him a little bit. Uh, then there's Herod the Great. We don't want to miss that Herod, there's lot, several Herods in Scripture. This is Herod the Great. This is the one that was uh, uh, a regent king appointed by uh, Caesar Augustus over Judea. Now, Judea, of course, is, is largely the territories of the, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, and he made his home in Jerusalem. So he's living in the capital of the nation over which he is regent king of. Now, and he was appointed by Caesar Augustus to do this. Now, at the time that he was appointed uh, to Judea, uh, Quirinius was already there, or Quirinius, I, 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 I mispronounced his name, but Quirinius was already there, and they didn't get along very well. So uh, uh, Herod appeals to Caesar, Augustus. Caesar then reappoints Quirinius to Syria, and he doesn't appoint him as a regent king, the way Herod is a regent king in, in, uh, in Judea. He appoints him as the, the kind of the, the head of the PBA. His job is to execute the Roman method of tax collection. 
That's so that's what he does. And his territory is all of Samaria, which includes which is huge territory, which also includes the territory of Judea. And so that's how he becomes a part of this kind of network of people. Is that even though he's not uh, in position of, of of authoritative leadership in Judea, he does have the role of executing tax collection. And so when Caesar says it's time for uh, taxation, and we're going to begin this process with a census, that's where Quirinius steps in because Caesar's call to Quirinius is, hey, do a, do a census. And so that census is everybody heads back to the town of their birth to uh, 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 record their existence and for them to be assessed by Quirinius for their taxes. And then they'll go through the, the extortive measure, the mechanism of extorting those taxes out of everybody. But that's how that happens. So we begin with, with those three people. Then one of the other people in this kind of list of caste are the Magi. Now, we don't know how many there were. We always see in nativities three, and we attribute three because there were three gifts. But it could have been a, just a few. It could have been just a couple. It was at least two because they're spoken of in plural. And um, we know that no matter how many magi there were, there were more with them than just the, the, the magi themselves. And the magi, they were uh, scholars, rich, uh, not rich in necessarily riches, even though they were well provided for. Uh, they were rich in wisdom, and they were from the east, largely what we might consider of a Persian, a Persian descent. And we say Persian descent because that's largely the culture that was uh, in the area at the time. The Persian Empire began uh, roughly in the 550s BC uh, and was the product of, of kind of preparatory cultures that built that culture. And they, uh, they had amassed huge amounts of wisdom. They were, they were probably the richest in wisdom of all of the cultures in the area because they were very careful to pass this wisdom on. And so that's where they were coming from. And they would have most certainly had a large entourage with them. They were traveling from the east to Jerusalem through the desert. They were going to have lots of camels, tents, cooking utensils, food, provisions, uh, servants who, uh, who, who managed all this, extra livestock. So it wasn't just like three dudes on a camel. So that's, that, that's the picture we get. That it wasn't that. It was a much larger entourage than that uh, for them to come. But the Magi are a significant contributor to what we're And oh, the last thing you want to know about those guys is they're not Jewish. They're not Jewish. In fact, they're what we would contemporaneously call Iranians. They're just the Persian Empire through the... Uh, through the uh, 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 revolt in what's I think 79 now formed uh, the, the, the the final formation of the nation of Iran uh, and the overtake of the Shah. They're what we would call today the Iranians and that was largely their territory even though it swept down a little southern from that area now also. And then the 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 kind of personality less personality if we if we think of it that way the star. That great star. And so we don't know a whole lot about that star other than it rose in the east. I'm sorry, it didn't rise in the east. We, we say that. I want to get into that in a minute. It rose, and we also know that it moved, that it wasn't a stationary star. Now, we know that the heavens are in constant motion, uh, but this one moved in a very particular way. And, and what you would want to know about this is that the star didn't point only to the birthplace of Jesus. It pointed to the current location of Jesus. So when the star rose and was seen by the uh, 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 by the the magi uh, in in what is the west, because they're from the east and they see the star rise in the west. If the star rose in the east, they'd be heading the wrong direction. The, the star rose, and we're going to get into that for in a, in a moment here too, in, in terms of a translation. But when they saw the, the, the star rise, they saw the star rise in the direction of west, which is the direction of Jerusalem. They head to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, so those are kind of the, the major players. So let's get a little more into our narrative. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, the Magi 
from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is born the king of the Jews? We saw the star. And this is the kind of the first break I want to make here. I have read a slew of, of, of translations and multiple interlinears, including my interlinear. And there's not a, a perfect consensus on this. Some of the Greek interlinears will, will read, we saw the star in the east and have come to worship him, which honestly doesn't make sense. Uh, if, if you see the star in the east and it leads you to Jerusalem, then you're somewhere out in the Mediterranean. You understand the, the, the geography there? Okay. So, but the, the, the other interlinear translations say, we saw the star as it rose. Now that one makes a lot more sense. We saw the star as it rose, and we have come. So if we read that, uh, where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw the star as it rose and have come to worship him. Now it makes a lot more sense. Now, again, I don't, I, I've seen both in interlinear translations from Queen Greek, and I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a Greek scholar, so, but I'm, but I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm, I'm willing to, to lend myself to when it rose. Now that's important because there's more than just the rise of the star. Now the next thing that I would bring up here is that uh, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You ever ask, how do they know? We got some stargazers in the east, highly educated scholars, who are the current repositories of huge amounts of intellectual capital that have been amassed for centuries. And they see an illumination, a star rise. And they conclude that when we saw that star rise, that's the sign of the Messiah. The King of the Jews has just been born. And so convinced are they that what they have just seen in the sky is the sign that the King of the Jews has been born, the, the Messiah of Jews has been, has been born, that they'll put together this whole entourage and travel across the desert to go to Jerusalem for the purpose of worshiping. And of what nationality are these guys? They're not Jewish. They don't, they, they didn't grow up in rabbi school. And they didn't go to the seminary. And they're not wrapped up in Jewish culture. They're what we would refer to, what they would refer to as Gentiles. Gentiles. Living honestly in what was a land that Israel has been at war with for centuries. And all of a sudden now, it's those guys who actually witness this star rise and they identify. Do you ever ask yourself, how is it that they came to that conclusion? I think I probably assumed that, that God appeared to them in a dream because even later um, they had An angel did come them. to warn them. They, yeah. yeah. I mean, that they had warned them in a dream that it might go back, but to right well with Herod. Mm -hmm. so I just. I think it's entirely possible. It's not that's not recorded, but it's entirely possible that that uh, that they were awakened in the middle of the night and say, "Hey, look west, see that star." I think it is fair to assume at least that there was something unique about that star other than the stars, because a part of their intellectual capital was that they were uh, astronomers. There's a difference between astronomy and astrology, and yes, there's a whole kind of astrology astrology component to to what was the, 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 the intelligence of, of, of the Magi, but they were, they were first and foremost astronomers, those who understood the, the movement, the location, the identification of stars in the sky. And they were very good at keeping calendars and seasons by that because that helped them do that. Uh, but they did see a new one. It's unique. It's not one that was there last night. Tonight, that's a new one. And it was identifiable enough to them as new. And maybe, maybe an angel came to visit them. That was not recorded. There's no, but we do have, yes, ma'am. Well, my Bible said, for we have seen his star. His star. That, that's, even, that's even better. Right. That's, what translation do you read? King James. King James. And it's his foreshadowed. 
So. Yeah, actually, mine says his star also. Yes. Yeah, that's even better. His star. It was his star. Yeah. How do how did they know that though? How did they? Some of the different than any other star. Yeah. How spectacular was it? If, it? if they were able to follow it to a certain spot, something had to get relatively close to the ground. We to totally you, have to get to that point. To give you some idea. And then I, I bring up, uh, I've been thinking about this quite a while. How lazy was Herod that he wouldn't travel five miles to Bethlehem to figure this thing out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's only I know months. just enough about you, Greg, to really appreciate that question and exactly how you phrased it too. No, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I mean, it, we know we know a little bit about Herod in that that uh, he was he was uh, a he was a privileged leader. He had uh, an entourage. He was very religious man, very very religious man. Even though he had a lot of religion, but overshadowing all of it was he was an extremely superstitious man and I, I think that may play a little bit into the the his reluctance to go himself is that when he heard that the king of the jews had been born if you're a roman leader how comfortable are you in your own skin and in your own chair you're not i just fill it in for you you're not everybody wants you off the throne there's always uh, uh, a, a new party, a new person, a new zealot who wants to come in and lead, and and many of many times it's of your own family. This is why so many of these families get get killed early and young in their lives because I don't want anybody challenging my role as king in this territory. And so if if I hear that uh, uh, there's a rumbling, that there's an insurrection afoot, well, I get a little nervous. If I can put a name to it, I kill it. But if I hear that the territory over which I'm king of, there's a rival king just been born, and, and, and people that are not even their people have come to tell me this, when we read later on, King Herod, when he heard this, was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But they're not disturbed for the same reason. Herod's disturbed for one reason. The people of Israel are disturbed for another. And Herod's disturbed because... Somebody has, somebody is, because I'm superstitious, I believe in this stuff, somebody has arisen who's going to undermine my authority. And there's a whole lot of people around here that believe that stuff. And that burden more is. Yeah, paranoid. It's a great paranoid. Did you have something to contribute again? Well, your hand. if if Herod went himself to meet the king of the Jews, then it would be interpreted that he bound down to a new king. Um, I think that that's possible, but we all know because we we know the entirety of the story. Right. Herod had no intentions of well, that. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, he was he was he, his intent was yeah, that, to that eradicate any threat to his authority. Yeah. Remember who's the high authority? authority? Send somebody else to work. Right. Yeah. Wait on the wait on the guy out for me, yeah. and then I'll I'll determine how I want to deal with right. it. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that if, if everybody lives under the highest governing authority principle, for Herod, the highest governing authority is Rome. The highest governing authority of Rome is Julius Caesar. And so, and my job is to run this territory. And if I don't run this territory well, then I lose my job uh, uh, appointed by Julius. And a lot of times, the way, or not Julius, but uh, Caesar Augustus. And a lot of the ways, a lot of the ways that a Roman emperor um, dethrones you from your job is to, to separate you from your head. Yeah. That, that's how it happens. And if you fail me, you die. And, and so that, that's how it happens. So he's got lots of reasons to be nervous. So here's what I want to I want to offer for you because I put a lot of credibility into this. Um, these magi came from the east. They are the repositories of huge amounts of wisdom. We should never think of Middle East the, the Middle Easterners as as uh, uh, as uneducated or incapable or marginally marginalized in, in in some way. Yes, many cultures in the Middle East do live much more traditional uh, uh, lifestyles, much more consistent with much closer to the deep ancient heritage of the. But these are very capable people, and these guys, the Magi, these were the cream of the crop. These were the scholars. So here's what I want to share with you about where they come from. This empire that they come from 
that that um, uh, it was for it was it was a part of what would be fully known as Assyria. Now that, that's you know, this is where Quinarius comes in. Quinarius is he's the remember he's the he's actually his title is a legate. A legate is the the tax collector, the the, the senior most tax collector is a legate. Now that this is the territory he comes from. Now they're, they're coming from the east, and much of Assyria is to the north of Israel, and then it stretches down and wraps to the east of Israel, and then and then Israel, uh, Judea is between that and the Mediterranean. So they're coming from not the northern part of Assyria, but the eastern part of Assyria. Now. Well, where was it? we go back through the history? Assyria emerged through multiple empires that all began from Babel. It all began from there. So this acquisition of knowledge and 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 history has been they they have been the repositories of it. Yeah. Who was who was a part of the 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 intellectual capital out of Israel that was swept into captivity? By this same culture, so uh, approximately 500 years before this, mm -hmm. Daniel, Daniel. If we go to Daniel, we get honestly quite a treat. Daniel 9, 20, beginning at 24, 77 are to be decreed for your people. Your holy city has finished its transgression. To put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up a vision and a prophecy, to anoint the most holy one. That's a part of the prophecy. That's a messianic prophecy from Daniel. Now we're going to go into Daniel as we get into the new year. And I think I'm going to kind of lean on Brad a little bit because he's a little better at this than I, than I am. But um, the prophecy given by Daniel is there's a time frame. It will elapse, and there's a lot of debate about that time frame. We're talking about weeks and years and 77s and what a seven is. We go, and I don't, I don't want to get in, in the math because I get all juju out on that, so I, I don't want to get in the math. But what we know is, is, is at the end of this season of time, the most holy one will be anointed. It's a messianic prophecy. I'm going to suggest to you that that wasn't just lost in the in the mists of time. That it's very possible that that was part of what was passed on generation to generation in the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom by the Magi. That that was carefully coddled. We're not Jewish people, but we had for 70 plus years of Jewish intellectuals that we gleaned and stored a lot from. But that's not the only place. If we go a little further back into Numbers, there's a, a Messianic kingdom prophecy in Numbers. From Numbers 24, starting at verse 15, then he uttered an oracle, the oracle of Balaam, son of Baal, the oracle whose eyes see clearly, the oracle of who, one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are open. And this is the oracle. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but he's not near. A star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. Now he'll go on with more, and if we do, then we're going to get we're going to get kind of mired in a lot of the, the other detail, which which we don't want to get to. But even back at the time of Moses, when honestly not Moses, this would be the time of of, of um, um, Joshua, the time of Joshua. Moses would have passed at this time. Uh, even at this time, the the prophecy of the, of the Messiah is being recorded by a prophet of God in this in this case, Balaam, who said that that it would be signified by a star. Now, in contemporary language, and I, and, and I think there are some commentaries that will say this, they will refer to a star as a, a prominent one, the way we might use star today, uh, American Idol, rock star, the whole. The, that's not that that's 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 contemporary Western idiom. That's that's not Middle Eastern early Jewish language. That star, quite literally, is a rising star, uh, a celestial body. Right? So it's in I'm going to suggest to you, and, and, and I lean heavily on this myself, that how they knew, the Magi knew, what they were putting together, 
And I'm not going to say apart from the Holy Spirit, so because I'm totally with you on, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I can lean too heavily on a divine uh, uh, a voice from God or an angel to the Magi, but I, I, I lean heavily on the Holy Spirit's anointing. What you see over there, that new star you see, that's not any star. Look at look at the look at the wisdom that you all have collected. You'll recognize what that star is. I, I'm, I put a lot of weight, a lot of gravity on on the idea that the Holy Spirit led these men to put two and two together to understand what they saw rise is the star of the uh, of the Messiah. So and now I've, I've totally this is hard to do with without. Being All right, so now I'm going to suggest to you that where, how they, how they understood what they saw was because a collection of two things, a collection of Old Testament prophecy and wisdom that they would have gleaned by Israel while they were in captivity from one of the most vocal and prominent messianic and eschatological scholars, Daniel, through which huge volume of prophecy comes and numbers. And the Holy Spirit says, "When you what you saw there, guys, that's him. The time has come." When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Two reasons. I think there's two different people here that's disturbed for two different reasons. Herod's an easy one. I'm upset. I'm disturbed by this. I'm a superstitious guy. Anybody that's going to upset uh, my uh, uh, my apple cart, uh, I, I got to deal with in an appropriate manner. Jerusalem's disturbed also. All of Jerusalem's disturbed. If you're a, a good, observant Jewish uh, family, mother, father, young child in a, in a family, you're doing Passover every year. And, and although Passover is a huge accounting of your history, of your people, it funnels to the end of Passover, which points to one thing. The Messiah is coming. Now, if you're living in Roman-occupied Israel at this time, that could there no sweeter sound could be heard then the Messiah has come. That's what you're looking for, liberation. But liberation from a fully entrenched Roman occupation is going to mean that it, times are going to get hard before they get better. The idea of being liberated is great. And, and that, that's what we're all waiting for. But it, it, it won't. It, they have every reason to believe it's not going to be easy. Now, Jesus reinforced that for them. I have come to set you free. It's not the free, it's not the, the, the national uh, 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 dispensing of Rome instantaneously right now here in front of you that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm setting you free, you, from your sin. That's what I'm saying. So that's coming, but it's, it's, it's not easy. And so when, even though they don't even understand it yet, for all of Israel to hear that the Messiah is here, I mean, it's what we've been waiting for, but really this is it. There's a, there's a disturbed condition in their minds as well. Now when all the, uh, uh, when he, Herod, had called together all the people, uh, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. Now they're going to say later on that, uh, uh, when Jesus is, is uh, called a Nazarite, born in Bethlehem, uh, that uh, many, many of you, and I've got this marked in my Bible, many people get together and say, oh, no, 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 no. He, 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 nobody knows where the Messiah is going to be born. And i got a big not true marked in, 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 the, in the side of my Bible here. But they know. The prophecy does exist. This is the kind of come in and know me better man is, watching these prophecies be fulfilled. And this one is actually illuminated for us. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. This is uh, the uh, uh, prophecy, I believe this was Micah. Yeah, Micah 5.2. This, this is where Micah checks in and tells us that it, when the Messiah comes, he's going to come from Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem is the city of David. 
And it was the city of David because it's the birthplace of David. The, the name Bethlehem, the city, means city of bread. Uh, now, you can say city of bread, uh, provision. Or you can say city of bread, manna, word of God. I think you're, I think you're in good standing either way. Uh, but when Jesus is coming from, when the Messiah is, we don't know his name yet, when the Messiah is coming from Bethlehem, that's one of those things that if you're a good observ observant Jew and you've got your little uh, um, uh, uh, Messiah journal going, you'd have written that one down. So, and they did. That's the cool thing about what you're seeing here is they did. They didn't have to go, well, let's go search the, the, the scriptures and see what they say. They knew. They knew, oh, well, when the Messiah comes, he comes from Bethlehem. And so they were able to answer Herod's question right away. Now, Herod's obviously talking to them. They obviously know there's magi in town. They've come to tell us that, the, that a star has risen and that they believe that is the sign of the birth of the Messiah. Herod's upset about it. The, all of Israel's big, uh, 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 Jerusalem is pretty, pretty disturbed over it. The chief priests are having to come in and have a conversation with, with the, the, the highest governing authority in, in all of, of, of Jerusalem right now, um, Herod, and tell him that uh, the answer to your question is, you know, that's pretty simple. We don't have to get on, on, uh, on Jeopardy to get this one. This is, it's Bethlehem. Then Herod called the Magi together secretly. Now, what the conversation you just had was with all the chief priests and elders of Israel. You know, now this is your first clue that Herod's up to no good. He didn't want to include the chief priests and all the elders and, the, and those who are leaders amongst the Jewish people. He wanted to corner just the Magi. And say, I, I need you guys to go find him and let me know because I want to worship him. Now, we know that this is a feigned claim because we know the history here. His goal is to destroy, not to worship. Uh, so, he called the Magi and secretly found out from them the exact time the star appeared. Now, the exact time the star appeared, when, did, when do we know the star appeared? At the birth. We know the birth, star first rose at the birth. Now this is, this is I think Daniel alluded to it this morning, the, the traditional nativity we have with Mary, Joseph, Jesus, uh, the shepherd, the, the wise man, the angel, that's kind of the traditional nativity. We have a, a couple of nativities in our home that have the same assembly. That's a collection of narrative. It's not a snapshot, it's not a picture of the stable or the cave, or the, uh, the, 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 the birthplace of the manger. It's not a picture of that. It's a collection of the history that took place there. The Magi were not in Bethlehem with Jesus when he was born. But what we do know is that the star rose at the time of the birth. That's when they left somewhere deep in the east and made their track across, or, yeah, in, in the east, made their track across the desert to get to Jerusalem, have the conversation with um, uh, uh, Herod, and then it's roughly 20 miles south out of Jerusalem to Bethlehem. You come south out of Jerusalem. Jesus isn't there. He's not in Bethlehem at this time. He's already, he's already gone. The Magi don't catch up with him until much later. He sends him to Bethlehem. Go ahead and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me um, that I may go worship. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and... Uh, the star they had seen rise went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now this is another this is another one of your good indicators as to this star. If you just pick any star in the sky tonight, if you can see stars tonight, and see if you can identify based on that star a specific place on the surface of this planet, and, and that's not going to happen. That's not yeah, yeah, that that star that rose. Uh, uh, over Bethlehem, or at, at least in the, in the line of sight of where they were in the east when they saw it rise. Now, uh, the, the word star translated here is aster, and it can it's, it's used two ways in, in scripture, in, in Greek. One is celestial body, planet. The other is celestial body, angel. And you'll see aster being used angelically throughout the book of Revelation. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that what they saw was maybe closer to what Marcia shared with us a minute ago, a, div uh, a divine light given by God for which they had no other definition of than a star. 
and it was it perfectly fit the model, and that's perfectly fine. But that star actually wasn't just signifying the birthplace of Jesus, but the present location of Jesus, because it moved. Now those stars out there, they're in motion, but they're not moving a little bit like the, the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that was leading Israel through the desert. But this star is. This star is leading these guys to the current location of Jesus. Again, not the birthplace of Jesus, but the current location. There was at one time in Bethlehem. That's why they went down there. They saw the star rise. They heard from the, the chief priest that in Bethlehem is where they're going. So they go down there, but he's not there at that time. They stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. A lot's made of those three gifts. Um, I'm, I don't, I don't have a really, uh, a really great handle on on those three gifts, but I do know this much: that they were no less than tradition. Mary and Joseph were were common uh, 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 Nazarites. They were from Nazareth. If you remember, they're from Nazareth. Uh, they were common Nazarites. Uh, we know from Luke that eight days after Jesus was born, they had completed everything that was required of them by the law and the presentation of the temple, the, the pronouncement of Anna and Simeon on the recognition of the, uh, the Messiah. And they went back home. And where's home? Nazareth. Nazareth is well north of Jerusalem. So they're 20 miles south for the birth in Bethlehem recording uh, for taxes. And then they go back into Jerusalem eight days later, complete the uh, requirements recorded by law. And then they go back home, which is Nazareth, which is well north. It is highly likely that it is in Nazareth that the Magi finally caught up with them because they're following the star as Jesus moves the star moves. They're following this this aster, this and I'm gonna I, for, for, for me I, I just can't put Saturn in this category. This is something far more divinely mobile, divinely pointing, uh, uh, indicating than than a celestial body. This is and to the best of my definition, to the best of my understanding, what we're following is an angel that that has the presence of the brilliant light as of a star. So they presented him with provisions. Now, the provisions are because what they don't know, but Joseph is about to find out, they're going to have to make a journey. And they're going to have to do it very quickly. And they're going to need provisions to make that journey. And they're going to be going into a foreign land for which they don't have jobs, they don't have they don't have any they don't have a place to stay. They're they we didn't call ahead and, and Get the, the room at the Hilton down in, in Cairo. It wasn't Cairo, but down in Egypt. Uh, that, that didn't exist. They had to go down there on a moment's notice in the middle of the night. They had to, to launch out for this. I'm going to suggest that the, that the gifts of the Magi were a gift to honor, were a gift to worship, that they were provisioned for a journey that they didn't know that they were going to have to make. And having been warned in a dream not to go, um, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Herod's in Jerusalem, birth in Bethlehem, they're in Nazareth. They've got to go south past Jerusalem to Egypt, and they're going to go back east into their own country. So this is where, this is the kind of the great divide. Everybody's heading in different directions right now. Herod's upset. When Herod finds out that he's been duped, he gets upset. And that's when he issues a decree. And this helps us with time. That helps us with time generally. This helps us with time a little more specifically. Herod sets two years and under. He knew enough to know that from the time that the Magi said the star rose to the time that, that, that he's kind of lost control of the event, about two years have passed. This helps us know that it's approximately in that two years of age range, when Jesus was approximately two, that they had left Nazareth and they started heading south. This gives you an idea about how long the Magi have been following, have been chasing this star, this aster, to find this king of the Jews. And remember, they're not Jews. They're just Gentiles. When they had gone, 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search, uh, is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and he took the child with his mother. During the night he left for Egypt. There he stayed till the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt, I'll call my son. So they go to Egypt and they're held, they, they stay in Egypt. And, and you, 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 you just can't miss that. <clears throat> Egypt historically has always been this icon for sin. But today, Egypt is being used for preservation. God specifically takes Joseph, Mary, and Jesus and says, the safe place for you is Egypt. And I want you to go now, in the middle of the night, get up, take the child and his mother, and head to Egypt. Because that's where I'm, I just gave you the provisions for the trip. Go to Egypt because that's where I'm going to preserve you. Now, after Herod dies, then it, the, the, the angel of the Lord comes back to Joseph and says, it's, it's, it's well, it, it, it is safe now. You can come back. But when they come back, they find out that I think it's Antipas that's on the on the throne at the time, and they're concerned about that. So they head back on up then to, to deeper up into Judea, into, into Nazareth again. But they are preserved down there. So when we get to kind of to this point in the narrative, and I want to make sure that I get this right. And I, and I, and I, Josh, I don't have this, I don't have this cited. If somebody can cite this one for me. Oh, no, there it is. It's, 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 it's back in Matthew. So we are going to go a little bit further than Matthew. When Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave an order to kill the boys in Bethlehem in this vicinity uh, where were two years old and under and in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. That was then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice in Ramah is heard, weeping a great mourning, Rachel, Rachel weeping for her children. It was already prophesied that Herod would try this. And all the boys in this territory, two years old and younger, were, were systematically killed under this edict from Herod in his attempt to kill the one boy that was the prophesied king of Israel. And that prophecy comes through Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the one that tells us that here's if you're if you're writing stuff down in your Messiah journal, if that come in and know me better by my birth is important to you, then this is as 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 dark an event as this is. Where thousands and thousands of young boys were killed simply because they were males born within the past 24 months. That was prophesied. That was fulfilled through the edict of Herod, regent king, during the time of Quirinius' uh, 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 census for the purpose of taxation under Caesar, Caesar Augustus. That prophecy was fulfilled. These seeds of prophecy were planted hundreds and hundreds of years before this series of events of just following the birth of Christ. If you want to know Jesus better, if you want to know Jesus more fully, take time to know him through his birth. Take time to hear how God laid this path out well in advance to bring his son and to preserve his son. And if you go to Revelation, you'll see that there's a window of time when uh, the, the uh, um, uh, 1,275 days, I think, it's three and a half years, of preservation of the baby given birth by the mother while Satan, I think Herod, sought to snatch the child and kill it. It's, it's, this is recorded in Revelation also, and it was preserved. So the last thing, we, we do have to, to wrap. The last thing I want to share with you was, is uh, something that, that Brad and I dis had discussed earlier um, uh, last week, and it's a passage that it, I find puzzling, but I also find very interesting, and it also helps me in, in terms of perspective. This comes from Isaiah, 
And this is a, pro a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And it is part and parcel to what we're talking about this morning. Because we want to be really careful about how we see the world when we see the contemporary events unfold as it relates to prophecy, the historical events that have fallen behind it, and what is yet to come. And this prophecy is yet to come. It's recorded by Isaiah. It will be a sign, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, and just to, make, to, to, to reference this, this is Isaiah 21, and I already started starting in verse 20. I'm sorry, Isaiah 19, and I'm going to start in verse 20. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt when they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a defender, and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make for himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifice and grain offerings, and they will make vows to the Lord and keep them, and the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague, and then he will heal them. They will return to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. We're talking about the Egyptians. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be third, or I think Brad gave me a translation, amongst the three. Israel will be either the third or amongst the three, along with Egypt and Assyria. You know some of this history. You know what these people are capable of, what they've done. But this is what God is saying about Egypt, Israel, and Assyria. In that day, Israel will be amongst the three, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. It's hard for us to think of Egypt and Assyria being a blessing on the earth. This is the prophecy of the Lord. The Lord Almighty will bless them, Egypt, Assyria, Israel. Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, if you're like me, that's tough to swallow. If, if, if you're a Jewish man, that's going to be almost impossible to swallow. These nations have worn against us. You have preserved us from these nations. There has never been a time at which there has not been enmity between ourselves and these nations. And if you, if you look at contemporary uh, um, uh, geopolitical climate, it's, it's no less in to, to the best of, of what I would consider, it's still at a fevered pitch, the animosity between the Israeli Semite world and the non-Israeli Semite world. That the, the animosity couldn't be, it couldn't, it could hardly be any higher. And yet, there's going to be a time when Egypt will recognize God for whom He said, and He'll do it via a deliverer. He's going to save Egypt. Assyria, this is, remember, Assyria, that's Babylon, <laughs> will be my handiwork, and Israel my inheritance. Where there is no peace in the Middle East, and has never been, where there will be a time, and it will not be because some American president, no matter how good we are, or how noble our intent may be, has brokered a peace plan in the Middle East. It will be because God has bound them together and bound them together under his name. That's what he said. They'll bow down and worship me together as one. Egypt, my people, Syria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, I come to this kind of from the end. What does it mean to be the inheritance of the Lord? What does that mean? That what, what, Israel, through Israel, the Messiah comes. This is the inheritance. What does that mean? I don't have a perfect answer on that. But as we consider what it means to know him better through his birth and know the history of these nations, it's worth us remembering that God has a much, much bigger plan than we can wrap our arms around. And we would want to remember that Egypt, my people, Syria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Because when we are looking towards what Daniel spoke of today as the end of the time of the Gentiles, the language of revelation being no longer prophecy but fulfilled in our sight, we will be deceived if we are not remembering the full breadth of what is prophesied yet to come. Any thoughts before we close this morning?
All right. I think we are, are back to Ezekiel next week. If I'm, I think we we a little bit more Ezekiel. I think, and then we go to Daniel. Uh, yeah, we got a few more chapters. So Ezekiel uh, 28 next week. Look forward to it. Happy New Year, and uh, see you next year. <laughs> Brad, can you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, today, for Tom's lesson, for Daniel's sermon, for the privilege and opportunity to come here and worship you. Father, I pray that um, you keep us safe this coming week. Father, use us as you see fit for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I ask it.